Hello, and welcome to Cardio Flash College, a place to learn cardiology with flash animations. Today, we will talk about the atrial septal defects, one of the most frequent congenital cardiopathies on adults. As you know, there are different types of atrial septal defects. In this sense, we have septum primum, septum secundum, sinus venosus, and coronary sinus. It is relevant to know and understand the difference between all of them because the prognosis and the treatment is not the same. It is completely known that the atrial septal defects are the consequence of disturbances produced during the heart's embryonary development. In this way, understanding the details of this process could be helpful in this topic. The embryonary development of the cardiovascular apparatus begins 18 days after fertilization, when the primary heart field forms from the trilaminar embryonic disc's cranial portion of the mesoderm. Then, this field compacts itself until it forms two parallel threads called cardiogenic cords. Once these cords are established, two cavities inside them develop, giving origin, in this way, to the endocardial tubes these endocardial tubes migrate simultaneously to the internal portion and fuse together to create one primitive heart tube. In this manner, in just a few days, there has been shaped a cardiac tube with three perfectly differentiated histologic layers, endocardium, myocardium, and epicardium, and with five cavities, truncus arteriosus, bulbus cordis, primitive ventricle, primitive atrium, and sinus venosus. The embryonic heart starts functioning from the fourth week, pumping blood from the sinus venosus to the truncus arteriosus. Simultaneously, the cardiac tube begins to elongate and rotate on its own axis until it remains folded in an S-shape, allowing, in this way, that the main cardiovascular structures acquire a position similar to the adult heart. Examples of these cardiovascular structures are truncus arteriosus, conus codis, future right ventricle, future left ventricle, future left atrium, and future right atrium. At last, the cardiac septation begins on day 28, when the formation of the endocardial cushions in the atrioventricular canal occurs. Later, the formation of the interatrial septum, the interventricular septum, and the differentiation of the conus codus and the cardiac valves will begin. As said before, the atrial septal defects occur because of disturbances produced during the cardiac septation. In this way, it will be interesting to take a look at the process of formation of the interatrial septum. To understand this embryonic process, it is necessary to study the common atrium in different perspectives, the transverse plane to the left and the sagittal plane to the right. The first step is the formation of the septum primum, this is a membranous tissue that grows from top to bottom and from back to front, beginning from the root of the common atrium and ending in the endocardial cushions. After that, part of this membrane reabsorbs to give origin to the foramen secundum, also known as ostium secundum. The second step is the formation of the septum secundum. This is a membrane that locates to the right of the septum primum parallel to it. It grows from bottom to top and then attached to the endocardial cushions too. Finally, these two membranes fuse together to form the interatrial septum, inside of which can be found the foramen ovale. It is now easy to comprehend how the atrial septal defects produce. Let's begin with the primum atrial septal defects. They develop when the septum primum does not fuse with the endocardial cushions, leaving a defect at the base of the interatrial septum that is not covered by the septum secundum. 
This type of defect accounts for 15 to 20 percent of the atrial septal defects, and they are usually not isolated, typically being associated with atrioventricular canal defects that include anomalies of the atrioventricular valves and ventricular septal defects. Secundum atrial septal defects account for 70% of all atrial septal defects and occur twice as often in females as in males. These types of defects are typically located within the fossa ovalis and they can result from arrested growth of the septum secundum or excessive absorption of the septum primum. Secundum atrial septal defects typically present as an isolated cardiac defect, though they may be contiguous with other types of atrial septal defects and functional mitral valve prolapse, perhaps related to a change in the left ventricular geometry associated with right volume overload. Sinus venosus atrial septal defects account for 5 to 10 percent of atrial septal defects and they are characterized by malposition of the insertion of the superior or inferior vena cava. The interatrial communication is within the mouth of the overriding vein and is outside the area of the fossa ovalis. It is more frequent in the superior vena cava and it is usually accompanied by partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Finally, coronary sinus atrial septal defect is developed by an unroofed coronary sinus because part or the entire common wall between the coronary sinus and the left atrium is absent. This rarer form accounts for less than 1% of all atrial septal defects. Many of these patients also have a persistent left superior vena cava. Now that we know how the atrial septal defects produce and difference, it will be easy to understand some of the clinical, diagnostic, and therapeutic aspects related to this pathology. However, our time is over. It has been all for today in CardioFlash College. We hope that you liked the video. If so, subscribe to the channel and leave a like. We'll see you in the next class. And remember, don't come late. Bye.